ooh, if you don't feel something after that, you're not alive. Tierra, that was incredible. And, and Stephen, your leadership is wonderful too. Well, good morning, everyone. The scripture reading for today is from the large collection of prayers, liturgies, songs, teachings, and laments that we call the Book of Psalms. In many cases, such as today, the Psalms show a more personal aspect of faith than we often hear in the Hebrew Bible. Many Psalms express the raw emotions of human life before God. Anger, hope, despair, bitterness, grief, gratitude, doubt, confusion, joy. Sometimes, like today, several of these emotions, good and bad, are expressed in the same psalm, which seems like a realistic reflection of life as we know it. Also, this seems like a good day to note, as we occasionally do, that the Bible often uses male pronouns for God. And in modern English, these pronouns seem to make maleness part of God's nature. The Bible, however, is clear that God is beyond gender. The Bible uses a variety of metaphors for God, and it is important not to let any single metaphor dominate too heavily. Finally, Psalm 27 refers to God in quite intimate terms, using the Hebrew version of God's personal name, Yahweh. This is sometimes translated in English as the Lord, but given that the name really means something like, I'll be whoever I want to be, it, really, it is really better to keep the more intimate use of God's enigmatic name. So, Psalm 27. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the place of refuge in my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers attack me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of Yahweh, one thing I will seek after, to live in the house of Yahweh all of the days of my life, to behold the beauty of Yahweh and to seek his guidance in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me on a high and safe rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to Yahweh. Hear, O Yahweh, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Yahweh, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, Yahweh will take me up. Teach me your way, O Yahweh, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my enemies, for false witnesses have risen up against me, and they are spewing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living. Wait for Yahweh. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for Yahweh. Thanks be to God for these words of life. Let us pray. Most blessed God, for this chance that we have to gather together today, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you have called each one of us to be here, that you have reached to us through the force of habit or through a struggle in our own lives or through a dull longing for something more. To be here, to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to hear your word and to respond with our lives. Thank you, gracious God, for this time. May you bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, that they may be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't claim to be the most self-aware person in the world, but one thing I have realized about myself through the years is that I am slow to process things emotionally. Looking back, I can see that it took me 10 years, the better part of my 20s, to deal with the emotional fallout of my parents getting divorced when I was 18. I once led a regional level HR committee for the, um, you know, the regional grouping of churches like our Illinois conference. I once led the HR committee for that group at a time when the staff, who were all friends of mine, were in bitter conflict. We ended up asking five of the seven staff members to resign, and it was terrible. All of our HR meetings were at the same little office space, and it took me years before I could enter that office space again without anxiety just coming straight into my chest. The genocide in Rwanda happened in 1994. A million people murdered, mostly by hand, with machetes, by people they knew. It disturbed my soul. I spent the better part of my 30s grieving that evil. Several years ago, one of my dearest friends turned out not to be the person I thought he was, and he betrayed some of the things that I hold, and I thought he held, most dear. I'm really still working on that one. In all of these situations, the end result of my emotional processing isn't something as positive or constructive as like inner peace or understanding, but really the result is something like the emotionally neutral netherworld that I guess we try, I guess, to describe it with the word acceptance. This happened. Somehow, I still believe God is love. Life goes on. In the face of Russia's war on Ukraine, I feel like it's going to take me a long time to process this emotionally, to get to a place as ambiguous as it is of acceptance. 
It is just such a vast violation of human life and decency. As brutal and awful as it is, we somehow dignify it by calling it war, as if murder isn't murder when it's done for some grand political reason. I get the criticism of those who wonder why the U.S. war against Iraq or the war in Afghanistan or the Assad regime's utter destruction of Syria or whatever other conflict around the world you want to pick. I get the criticism, those who ask why it doesn't quite hit me in the same way. Is it because the victims don't look like me? Does my racism manifest as deeper compassion for white people? I don't know why, but this strikes me more deeply. Actually, I am trying to understand why. I said I don't know why, but I'm trying to understand why. And to me, the depth of horror doesn't come simply because of the immense and innocent suffering of the Ukrainians, but also because of the perpetrator. There are now tens, maybe hundreds, maybe millions who share responsibility for this but this would not be happening if it weren't for Vladimir Putin. This abomination is his responsibility. And Vladimir Putin claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I apologize. Adam, you can put the first one up there. I apologize for the immodesty of the cover of your worship order today, but I had to make a point. You will see in this photograph, and those of you at home hopefully have seen the link online, um, the worship order is there, you can see that, or I don't know if Adam can point to that one. But you can see in that photograph that Putin is wearing a necklace. And that necklace holds a cross. The cross of Jesus Christ. Putin tells a story about that particular cross. Although he was long a loyal servant in the KGB for the Soviet Union, which of course outlawed religion, Putin now says that his grandmother had him baptized in secret even way back when he was an infant in Soviet days. He was given a cross upon his baptism, and his mother kept the cross through the years stored safely away. Many years ago, though, there was a fire and the cross burned along with everything else. But his ever pious mother, so the story goes, searched through the rubble and recovered the cross. Years ago, when Putin was going on a trip to Israel, his mother gave him the cross that apparently he previously didn't know about she gave him the cross to have it blessed in the land in which Jesus walked. He did, then he put the cross around his neck, and now he says that he never takes it off. And there are, of course, plenty of pictures of him with his shirt off that prove the point. The cross is there in every single one of those pictures. Now, because we've had a few other things to worry about, most of us, including the media that most of us see, right, left, or somewhere in the middle, most of us have not actually paid attention to what Putin has been saying for a good 20 years now. 
Nearly every war is justified by some big idea that must be defended. We have to protect freedom, or make the world safe for democracy, or fight terrorism, or free the proletariat from oppression. For Putin, the big idea behind this war in Ukraine is the protection of a holy Russia. In his rhetoric, he argues that everything that is good and holy in the world is under siege from Western immorality. And Ukraine is leaning toward the West, and he must grab it back for the sake of all that is good in this world. In his mind, Russia is the last bastion of all that is good and decent in the world, and it is his duty to make Russia great again, grounded in traditional values of generosity, of equality, traditional marriage, real masculinity, respect for authority, and all the rest that goes along with that. At the core of this vision is the Russian Orthodox Church the branch of Christianity that has been dominant in most Slavic countries for more than a millennium. To make a long story short, our Christianity and most of the Christianity we know comes from the Western, originally Roman part of the church. Russian Orthodoxy comes from the Eastern, originally Greek part of the church. We were united for 1,000 years, but about the year 1,000, the two sides went their different ways, both following Jesus Christ, but in different ways. Since his rise to power, Putin has overseen the reconstruction or refurbishment of about 23,000 Russian churches that fell into disrepair or disuse during communist rule. He has signed orders restoring the church to its massive land holdings that were seized under the communists, making the church the largest and one of the richest shareholders in Russia, landowners in Russia. Increasingly, in the past few years, Putin has hewed ever closer to the church's position on social issues, including conservative stances on homosexuality and abortion. He's careful about his language, but when you pay attention to what he's really saying, his vision is of a Holy Russia, a Christian people, one church, one Russia. Now, this would be one thing if Putin was just blowing smoke with all of this, right? Dictators will say anything to get people to support their goal of gaining power. Putin will say that the Ukrainians are bombing themselves and he's just moving in to liberate the poor people of Ukraine. And he has such control of the narrative that most people in Russia believe it. But one hypocritical narcissist doesn't really mean much. However, the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill, has publicly praised Putin's rule over his country, calling Putin a, and I quote, miracle from God. While some priests of the church have shown courage risking their lives for the sake of truth, I'll get back to that later, the leadership of the church has not condemned the war, and it shares and nurtures the holy Russia narrative that Putin creates. The church, 
You can go to the next one, Adam. The church quite literally blesses him. Like here, as he celebrated on the day of Epiphany the baptism of Christ by himself dipping down into the waters. You can see the holy icons and the golden cross behind him held by leaders of the church. And there's that cross again. As I have said of the imagery used by other world leaders, that is heresy. But I don't really mean to sound like the Russian Orthodox Church is unique. Evangelical Christians in this country have been cheering Putin on for years. They see similarities. They see, I'm not seeing, they see similarities between their vision of a family values Christian America and Putin's vision of a holy Russia. Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, of course, and until caught in a sex scandal not long ago, probably the most important leader of the evangelical side of Christianity, has met with Putin repeatedly through the years and admired his leadership. Franklin Graham has thanked patriarchal Kirill personally for the Russian Orthodox Church, for the Russian Orthodox Church's, quote, strong voice in defense of moral values. And he has lauded Putin for defending biblical values, quote, from the attacks of secularism. This is what's behind one feature of all this. It's been so confusing to most of us. This is what's behind the difficulty that many on the Christian right have had condemning Putin's war. Most of them have come around to doing so, but have obviously been conflicted about it. They have publicly supported his vision in the past. My personal struggle with this war, my difficulty in praying about it, my confusion about what to say about it, all of that is made so much worse because of that cross around Putin's neck, because of the church holding those crosses behind him, because my brothers and sisters in Christ have celebrated the power and the agenda of that man. It's going to take me a long time to process this emotionally. But what about now? What about how to worship now? What about how to pray now? What about how to be a Christian now when so many think that's what Christianity is all about? Well, I'm guided by Psalm 27. Let me lead you through this a little bit to show you why. Psalm 27 starts out, apparently, with confidence. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the place of refuge for my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
Maybe we could pray that way also before seeing what our brothers and sisters of Christ, in Christ have done to our faith. But that confidence in so many ways has been shattered. Can the Ukrainian people being crushed by those bombs pray, Yahweh is my place of refuge, of whom shall I be afraid? But that confidence, again, has been shattered. Something has happened, and it seems also it's happened in Psalm 27. The psalm progresses. Hear, O Yahweh, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Yahweh, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. That sounds a little more honest. That confidence is gone. This prayer is no longer full of assurance the, the words are now not a statement of fact, and you wonder whether they were a statement of fact even at the beginning. Maybe it was really something aspirational. The Lord is my refuge. But now they're clearly not a statement of fact, not a Lord will protect me, but a plea. Lord, please protect me. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me. And then, who knows how long it had passed in the life of the one who wrote this? Who knows what had transpired in life? Who knows what they had suffered, what they have endured? what they had been through. Who knows what had happened? Maybe years had passed, 10 years, maybe their 20s, maybe their 30s. And finally, we hear these words. I believe I shall see the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living. Wait for Yahweh. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for Yahweh. That sounds a lot to me like not resolution, not understanding, not peace, in your soul, but acceptance. This has happened. I still believe somehow that God is love. Life goes on. I think, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that's the place for us to end up now in the midst of this war. We cannot come to a place that makes this okay. We cannot come to a place of inner peace in the midst of this. We cannot come to an inner peace with the bombing in Ukraine, the murder, as it is rightly called, and we cannot come to peace with the narrative that Putin has put behind it and so many around the world have accepted. We can only hope to come to a place of trust, of acceptance. Someday, be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for Yahweh.
I want to close by giving you a different vision of the Russian Orthodox Church. I don't want it to sound like I am condemning some other them, because as I mentioned earlier in my sermon, there are those who are speaking up even within the Russian Orthodox Church. There are those who have crosses around their necks who actually want to honor what it means in their lives. 200 Russian Orthodox priests have literally, perhaps at the cost of their lives, spoken out against the war. It is our job to lift up their voices, to be in solidarity with them. And this is what those 200 have said. It's long. We need to hear it. We the priests and deacons of the Russian Orthodox Church, each in our own name, appeal to everyone on whom the cessation of the fratricidal war in Ukraine depends with a call for reconciliation and immediate ceasefire. We send this appeal after the Sunday about the last judgment and on the eve of the Forgiveness Sunday in the Russian Orthodox Church calendar, two Sundays ago was Last Judgment Sunday. Last Sunday was the Sunday of Forgiveness. Last Judgment awaits every person. No earthly authority, no doctors, nor guards will protect from this judgment concerned about the salvation of every person who considers himself a child of the Russian Orthodox Church, we do not want him to appear at this judgment bearing the heavy burden of the mother's curses. We remind you that the blood of Christ shed by the Savior for the life of the world will be received in the sacrament of communion by those people who give murderous orders not unto life, but unto eternal torment. We mourn the trial that our brothers and sisters in Ukraine were undeservedly subjected to. We remind you that the life of every person is a priceless and unique gift of God, and therefore we wish to return. We wish the return of all soldiers, both Russian and Ukrainian, to their homes and families, safe and sound. We bitterly Think about the abyss that our children and grandchildren in Russia and Ukraine will have to overcome in order to once again be friends with each other, respect and love each other. We respect the God-given freedom of humankind, and we believe that the people of Ukraine should make their choice on their own, not at gunpoint, without pressure from the West or the East. In anticipation of Forgiveness Sunday, we remind you that the gates of paradise are open to anyone, even a seriously sinned person, if he asks for forgiveness from those whom he humiliated, insulted, despised, or from those who were killed by the hands of his order. There is no other way but forgiveness and mutual reconciliation. Quoting Genesis, The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive the blood of your brother from your hand. God said to Cain, who was envious of his younger brother. Woe to every person who realizes that these words are addressed to him personally. No nonviolent call for peace and an end to war should be forcibly suppressed and considered as a violation of the law. For such is the divine commandment. Blessed are the peacemakers. We call on all warring parties to dialogue 
because there is no other alternative to violence. Only the ability to hear the other can give hope for a way out of the abyss into which our countries were thrown in just a few days. Let yourself and all of us enter the great season of Lent in the spirit of faith, hope, and love. Stop the war. May we come to a place, not of inner peace, but of acceptance, and be true to that cross that is right now burning the soul of one who wears it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.